What's up everybody, it's Parker with BI Elite. In this video, we're gonna cover how to perform looping in Power Query. This is a really cool technique that'll allow you to create a function that you can call over and over and over as many times as you wanna loop through that function. We're gonna walk through three different examples, each increasing in difficulty and business applications. So let's go ahead and dive into our first example. So let's go to the Power Query editor. So I have my file open here. So I've already created two of these loops and we're gonna walk through each of these examples. So we see that we have our first looping function here already created and I'm gonna show you the results first. We have a first column here with just numbers from one to 10 and we're actually calling this function on each of these rows here. And all this function is doing is it is looping through this many times and multiplying by two. So when the value is one, we're multiplying by two one time. When it is two, we're multiplying by two two times. So by the last row here, we're multiplying by two 10 times. So we can see we have two, four, eight, 16. And by the end, we actually have two to the power of 10, which is 1,024. So not too much business application here, but it is going to be a nice foundation in order to learn how to create this looping structure. So in order to do that, I'm gonna create a new function. We can actually get rid of our step to invoke that function. And let's go ahead and create that new function from scratch. So I'm gonna create a new blank query and open up the advanced editor. So the first thing you have to do is define some parameters. So all you have to do is create an open parenthesis and start typing in some parameters here. So I know exactly what we're gonna need. We basically need uh, something to track our total number of loops, which current loop that we're on, and maybe even a value in order to take that value and manipulate it somehow. So the first parameter I'm going to create is gonna be called total loops and I'm gonna write as number to create a numeric parameter. And then I'm going to create another variable called loop. This is going to be the current loop that we are currently iterating on. And that's also going to be a number. And finally, I'm gonna create a last parameter called value. This is gonna be the value that we're actually returning back to us and that we're gonna pass through to future iterations of this function. And then we need to have a hash rocket here in order to create that function. So now that we have these three parameters, we can go ahead and apply some logic in order to create this looping functionality. So I'm going to define a new variable here called current loop. And I'm gonna set that equal to loop plus one. So this is going to increase that loop number each time we go through uh, this function call. And then I'm going to type current value equals value times two. So this is going to take our value that we're passing in, multiply by two, and that is our new current value. So finally, we just need one output step. So I'm gonna call this output equals, and we'll create a conditional if statement saying if current loop is greater than or equal to total loops, then we want to return our current value else we wanna call our function again and pass in our new value. So we're gonna pass in our current loop or we're gonna pass in our current value and keep iterating over until we hit that total loops number. So we can actually call this same function that we are currently in with the at sign and then type in query one, which is the name of my function right now. Then we just need to pass in parameters in order to call that function again. So we can pass in our same total loops that has not changed but now we can pass in our current loop and our current value. So you can think of this as the first time we run through, we can set our total loops number to five per se. Our loop number in the beginning will be zero because it'll be our first time through and our value will be one, for example. And then we're gonna loop through, we're gonna change some of these variables and we're gonna pass through new values into this function and start it all over again. The last thing we need to do is return our output step that's going to allow us to run through all of this code here. And then finally, we're done. So let's go ahead and click done. And this is going to be our new function. I'm gonna call this, uh, let's just call it test function one. And when we open that up, we'll see that query one has now been replaced by test function one. So that's perfect. Let's click cancel. And now we can enter in some parameters and see if this works. So let's loop through five different times. Our loop in the very beginning will be set to zero. And then our value, let's set it to one. Let's click invoke and we'll see our value is 32. So that is two to the fifth, which is 32. We can get rid of this invoked function here. And let's go back to test function one. Let's change our total loops to eight. Our current loop is zero. 
and our value, let's start with uh, three. So let's invoke that. So that is basically three times two to the eighth, which gives us this number. But the really cool thing here is we can see exactly how many times this is looping through. If we change our test function one to instead return the current loop number, instead of the current value, we can see exactly how many loops it's actually going through. So we can see it's going through eight times when we set our total loops to eight. If we set it to, let's say 12, we can see that we're looping through 12 times. So now the really cool thing comes when you have a table and you want to run this function iteratively for each row in that table. We can do that by going to add column and invoke custom function. We will change our function query to the new test function one that we have created. And we can pass in column one as our total loops, but we need to pass in something for loop and value. And actually, since we have defined these parameters, we actually need to pass something in here. So we can pass in column one for the total loops. And then for loop and value, we can just pass in a constant here. Later in this video, we're gonna learn how to create optional parameters instead, so we don't actually have to pass anything in. But for now, let's type in zero and one and click okay. And now since we're still showing the total number of loops, we'll see the same value in this column as our previous column. But if we change this back to return our current value instead of our current loops, we will be able to get the current value for each row uh, in this data table. So now we have our final output here. Again, this is just to build the foundation for this looping technique. This next example will show you how you can use this in a way that you might encounter in a business setting. So we've actually created this already. It's called FX loop two. Let's take a look at the advanced editor. We're not gonna walk through each one of these lines because it is a very similar setup, but I will show you what we have created so far. So we have three different parameters very similarly. So we have loops as number, breed as text and optional results as a list. So this query is actually hitting an API that returns a picture of a random dog. And just to give you a quick example of that, I'm going to open up a new web source and paste this in here and show you what it returns. So it's a really cool API that's just going to return this picture of a dog. So we see that we have a Husky picture returning to us in the form of a JPEG. We can refresh this and get a new picture now we have a different dog, and now we have a Mastiff. It's a really cool API that you can just call many times. So I'm gonna delete that and come back to our function and walk through how we are able to iterate over this API call until we get something that we want. In this example, we're going to allow the user to enter in a certain dog breed that they want to query for, and we're only going to return results for that specific dog breed. So these first four steps are actually just reaching out and connecting to that API and getting data back and drilling down to that image URL. So you don't have to worry too much about this, but the looping logic starts here with current loop equals loops plus one, similar to the previous function. And then we have another step called current results. We're saying if results is null, then just return that message. So the message that we've drilled down to in our API call, else we want to combine the list of results with that new message. You don't have to do this for the purpose of looping. I just wanna show you all of the different times that this API is being called in order to return a value that we want based on the breed that we have entered. Let's actually go ahead and look at a quick example to nail this home. So in data, we can loop through 10 times. Let's get rid of our invoke custom function, go to add column, invoke custom function again, but instead let's invoke our loop that we were just looking at. So we're gonna loop through the number of times from column one, and then we can enter in a breed here. So if I wanna enter in, let's say, Terrier, which is a pretty common breed of dog, we can iterate through, call that API many different times, and in the current setup, this function is going to append each individual successful call until it hits uh, the breed that we have specified. So if we look at this list, we can see how many times we hit this API. We see the first time we got a poodle back, then a Mexican hairless, a Vizsla, a, a bloodhound, but then we can see at the very end we got a dandy terrier. So if we go to the second example, we see that our first API call was a terrier. And the 10th call, we see that we uh, had a bunch of results until we hit a terrier, probably around the 12th API call. So this is showing you how many times it's looping through, hitting that API, and then returning the result we want. So if we wanna change this just a little bit so that we don't actually append those previous results, we don't actually have to do that. So let's actually get rid of this one. 
And then let's actually return message. So don't worry about this one. This was just to show you kind of how this function is looping through, but instead we just need this output step that says, if text.contains our message, which is just the new URL, the picture URL that we are getting back, if the message contains the breed that we are looking for, then we want to return that message, just that image URL. Else, we can actually get rid of this debugging step. Else, we want to call our function again, pass in our current loop, pass in the breed that we want to look for, and pass in our current results. And we actually don't need this. Again, this was for debugging. Let's actually go ahead and get rid of these. If you think really hard about it, we don't necessarily need the count of the loops. That's just there in case you want to create an exit clause. For example, if text.contains message and breed or current loop is greater than 100, just to make sure you don't get stuck in an infinite loop, that might be a good idea. Uh, then we return that message. So then when we return the entire output, we either return the proper uh, picture URL coming back to us or we call that function again until we get a good picture URL. So finally, let's click done here. Let's go back to our data table and let's refresh our preview. Let's see that we're getting an error here. Let's see what we have. Uh, three arguments were passed to a function with which expects to. And that makes sense because we have changed our function. Let's go through and invoke that custom function again. And let's go to function query, fx loop two. And now we only need our loops and our breed. We don't need that optional list. Let's type in, instead of looking for a terrier, let's look for a spaniel. And let's click OK. And it might take a little while for us to reach out to the API and return only spaniel records because that's not as common of a dog. So give this just a little bit. And there we go. After a little bit of time, we can see that we have returned some results here. Let's see what we have. So we have all spaniel records. That's awesome. So now we're able to hit that API as many times as we need, just return the uh, information back that we want. And you may say to yourself, why don't we just return all that data and filter it down? We could do that, but that's not necessarily what we're trying to accomplish here with the looping. And you'll see that more in the next example that we're going to cover. So let's take a look at that final example. I'm gonna to go to my Power BI admin view. So this is actually related to the Power BI admin view series that I'm still currently working on. In part three, that'll come out very soon, we're gonna learn how to loop through and get all of your user activity data. So if we go to this activity table, we can see all of the different days of data that people in my Power BI tenant have been active in Power BI, but it's actually interesting how you have to call this API. You basically get all the activity back in one hour increments, and you actually need to call the API multiple times in order to get all of the user activity data back. So when you call the API the first time, you need to pass in a certain date range that you wanna get data back for, and then it's going to give you a piece of it and also a continuation token, which you need to pass that continuation token back into the API call and keep calling it over and over and over until you have all the data. So this is a very good example in order to show you a nice business use case, which may be pretty popular with APIs. So in our get activity function here, I'll show you exactly what we have. This setup will look very similar to our other examples, just a little bit more specific. So we are going to cover this in depth in our video for part three of the Power BI Admin View series, but I do wanna show you just a little bit how this is working behind the scenes. So we see we have a bunch of parameters up here, but the really important one is this continuation token. So when we call this API the first time, we don't have to pass this in. We're only passing in the start date and end date. As you can see here, when I say if loop equals zero, then we're calling this API with some start date time and end date time parameters. If the loop is not zero, we're actually just passing through a continuation token that is retrieved from that API. So after we go down here and apply some logic in order to loop correctly, we can see that we call our function get activity and also pass through that token again. And at this point, we don't need to pass in a start date or an end date. We just need to pass through that continuation token. Without going too far into this, you can start to see why this looping is really important because it allows us to pass in something, get something back, and keep passing that through and through and through until we get all of our data. So if we click done, we can go ahead and go back to the activity table, and I'm going to extend my date range out just a little bit so we can get a little bit more data. I'm gonna go all the way back to the 10th of June, and I wanna pull data back for all days until then. So 10th of June until today, and let's go ahead and refresh our preview. 
and it is going to run through and hit that API many times until we get all of our data back. And there we go. We see we have all of this data, which we had to call that API multiple times in order to retrieve. And this is just that final example to show you in a complicated state, we are able to loop through and call something multiple times in order to get basically everything we need. So I hope you see the benefit of doing something like this. There are a lot of possibilities that you can open up once you are able to call your functions over and over based on that at call. So let me just open that up one more time. We can see that we're able to call this same function just by typing in at at the beginning of the function in order to create that iteration. So I hope you like this detailed video on how to create that iteration within Power Query and I'll see you in the next one.